Awesome. So uh, I, I did this talk, and in typical fashion, I waited until the last minute to kind of do my slides. And then uh, Dave just gave his talk. Now, I was originally supposed to be at noon. So originally, it was going to be Dave stole, like I stole Dave's talk, but Dave stole a lot of the stuff from my talk. So I thought the webcam cover was enough to stop him. Because you know, he would send me messages like, I like your shirt, you know, <laughs> where's the pants, you know, whatever. But apparently, that's not enough to stop Dave. But that's OK. We've got a lot of good stuff. But at the end of the talk, I've got anti-hacking Dave uh, camera covers for everyone that wants to have one. Uh, they work really well, apparently. Uh, so a little bit about me. My name is Ben 10. Uh, I'm not 10. I, I, I know I look 18, 20, whatever the case may be, the new intern. I'm actually older than Dave Kennedy. Uh, most people don't realize that. Uh, it's actually really interesting when I go on site to locations because they'll talk to the taller people. And they'll be like, they'll be like no, I'm the project lead. They're like, no, you're so cute. Who's the real one? <laughs> so uh, no, I, I've been in the industry for quite some time. I'm a senior security consultant with TrustedSec. Uh, been there for almost two years now. I've been in the industry for quite some time. Um, I started out as a developer 20 years ago. Uh, one of the first things I developed, uh, some people might know, is a, is a, is a kind of a malware tro Trojan video game. So we were supposed to write a game for credit. Uh, so my, pr my partner and I, we thought it would be much more fun if we uh, added some background stuff to the game. So what we did is, it was a 2D side-scroller, and the, the game, you know, you'd go across and you'd shoot zombies and stuff like that. And we knew the professor was going to test it. So we're like, hey, let's add this one little piece to it. So every time you killed a bad guy, it would randomly delete one of your files. <laughs> so the longer and longer you played, the worse your system got. And this was back in 95, 96, so there really wasn't a lot of protection against that. So we actually deleted autoexec.bat, win.ini, you know, so a lot of those fun things. Uh, so after I did that, I did infrastructure for 13 years. Uh, so been a help desk monkey, been a sock monkey, been all that. Um, then I went into management and did VP for eight years. Um, I'll never get those eight years back. Um, and then I decided I was going to stop, and I switched, and I went, up, went to the offensive side. So I'm, I'm able to speak on both aspects of this. And that's what makes it really unique when I go to do consulting, because I've been on both sides. A lot of times you'll get a consultant in there, and they'll be like, well, you don't have network segmentation. That's the first thing you need to do. I'm like, son, you better get out of here. Because that's not easy. It's like building a basement after the house is done, and then you have to build the basement while people are still living there. So network segmentation isn't necessarily always the best solution or even plausible solution. So I have to, I'm able to understand both sides of the aspect. I understand the offense piece, but I also understand and appreciate how difficult it is to actually do defense as well. So this talk is how I'm actually able to bypass a lot of the defense stuff and I'm going to show you exactly what I do. So it's very similar to, kind of similar to what Dave was talking about, but specifically to one, what attacks that I use. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the purple teams that I, I, I work with uh, with Dave. So I am a lot older than I, than I look, but I am a dad. I have a nine and a seven. And one of my favorite things is dad jokes. And so I'm a small dude. And so we have these uh, older kids that are doing football in the neighborhood. And one, comes, one guy comes up to me, he's like, do you even lift, bro? And I'm like, no, I Uber. <laughs> I was the only one that laughed. So <laughs> I like dad jokes. So. so this is the issue, right? Is that, you know, we as, as a defense, like we're constantly going out and we're like, hey, I've got this. I've got extra hearts. I've got extra things. And then all of a sudden, things get in our way, right? We come up with a new attack, MS-17-010. WannaCry comes. We're like, that's okay. We still got this. We still got this. We're like, no, it's okay. I'm good. I got a couple extra hearts. I'll be fine. Like, hey, we got this patch. And then all of a sudden, there's a new Metasploit, or, uh, Metasploit thing, and it BSODs with MS-17010. And you're like, that's okay. I'm still okay. Look, there's water. I'm going to make it. And I'm out. <laughs> right? And this is unfortunate. This is what happens a lot of times that we see in defense. It becomes very frustrating very fast because we feel like we're always behind. We're always catching up. The problem is, is that we're not looking at defense the way that we should. We oftentimes will look at defense. We're like, hey, 
uh, we don't have it perfect, but we spun up our own thing. So I got this, no problem, right? We've got our own internal thing. We're not buying a blinky box, but that's okay because I have this new thing that the vendor told me was going to be perfect. It's one shield. Oh, shit. But that's okay. That's okay. I've got another solution, right? I'm going to sit there and I'm going to, I've got this plan. We're going to solve this. We're going to win, right? No problem. We've got our SIM. We've got a perimeter detection. We've got all of this other stuff. We've got everything we could possibly buy that succeeded our budget, right? But then at, we get a local pen test company comes in and all of a sudden they find Tomcat with default credits. And you're like, oh, okay, well, that's bad. Oh, and then they find that it's running as local system administrator. Oh, okay, well, that's maybe not so bad. Then they find MS17010. Oh, okay. Well, then they find MS08067, and they're like, shit. And then they destroy your network. So from a, from a defender's point of view, it's constantly frustrating. You feel like you're always losing the game. In fact, I've been on an engagement where the defenders actually think it's such a game that they start pissing around with me. So I was on an engagement. I had shells all over the place. And I finally, I'm being nice, I give them an update. I'm like, hey, just want to let you know I'm DA. I got this, this, and this, and this. I go to lunch. I come back, and I try and run it's just a you know a IP config. A command prop has been disabled by administrator. I'm like, you son of a. So I try PowerShell. It's disabled. The problem is they only did it on the VPS that they assigned, and they didn't do it on the five other boxes that I had. So they, cr they did this, and so that's when I started creating my own tools. And I started writing other things. So I'll show you not PowerShell, but not PowerShell spawned from that very scenario. When a defender looks at a situation, they look at a pen test as a game, it, it hurts our industry, right? Part of it is when you look at a pen test, you're looking at, I'm failing as a defender. And that mentality needs to go away. A pen test is not to necessarily to highlight your failures. It's highlight areas that you can improve. That's it. That's the idea. It's not meant to be, a, it's not meant to be you suck at this. Just quit. Uninstall, bro. Right? That's not what we're looking at. The pen test, I'm there to help you as a pen tester. So what oftentimes will happen is I'll get on an engagement and I will get DA long before I get any alerts that you guys have detected me. So I want to show you some of the techniques that I use because I want you to go back and reevaluate how you're doing defense, right? So this is what I do with our purple teams. The, our purple teams isn't just all red with a little bit of blue saying you need to buy this. I actually sit down with you and I go through and I use your resources, your sim, your products, your whatever, and I help you define and write rules to detect the attacker behavior. And it goes beyond just the initial vector. The initial vector isn't nearly as important as what the attacker does when he's on the network. I have been in many different industries, financial, whatever. I can get a job just about anywhere. And I can get an internship, no problem. I was on an engagement, it was a physical break-in, and you know, during physicals, I get thirsty, so I always stop by the coffee because it's free coffee for me. And one guy comes up and he's like, hey, new intern. I'm like, yeah, yes I am. They're like, what department? I'm like, well, I'm trying to break into IT. He's like, dad, don't worry. I know a lot about computers. You stick with me, buddy. I'm like, thanks, man, I appreciate that. We get to the closeout meeting and I'm sitting at the table and he walks in, he's like, that was you? I'm like, yep. And he's like, son of a, and he sat down, <laughs> right? So I can get an internship anywhere. Once you give me creds on your network, I am probably your highest risk at that point. Your perimeter defense is going to stop me? No. A lot of my attacks don't require exploits. Most of the stuff that I do, I'm not exploiting things. So when we do this purple team, that's what we kind of look at. So one of the first things we have to get around typically is your IDS or IPS. Right? And I get on there and I get to the client and we always get the, the client that's like, yeah, we've got our IPS, it's finally tuned. No worries, man. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna let you know like within 15 minutes that you've done something. I'm like, dude, that's awesome. Be great if you did. We get to Wednesday and he's like, so have you started yet? <laughs> so, uh, Nmap, great command. I don't run Nmap standard. 
So this is a half open scan. So you have a three-way handshake, right? Sin, ack, sin, ack. Half open goes sin, ack, and then I close the connection. I don't send back the sin, ack, right? So this is half open. That's what that SS does. I only do one port at a time. That's it. I don't do top 100. I don't do top 20. I do one at a time. I'm also doing do you guys, G53. That actually sets a source port. A lot of your IDSs, IPSs, they look for where your destination port is the same as your source port. If you just put port 445, in that connection, Nmap will put the source port as port 445, not a randomized port. So DNS, fantastic. Uh, you can also do uh, Kerberos, uh, some of the NetBIOS traffic as well. Um, I typically do 53 because very rarely does anyone inspect d DNS traffic as a source port. So I put my source port as 53. I never ping. Um, I don't do name resolution because I don't want to call any DNS servers. and I. Uh, only do the slash slash open. So with this, typically, I rarely, if ever, trip up anyone's IDS or IPS. And this is what I do. I do one port at a time. No T4s, no top 1000, none of that. It's one port at a time. Now, that seems slow and arduous, but that's the idea, right? Because I know you're looking for me. So I want to try and get as much information from you as I can without you even knowing that I'm doing anything. So looking at some of this stuff here is looking at exactly what somebody might want to do. Even before I do an NMAS spam, so this is what uh, Dave was kind of talking about, and we're gonna, I'm going to do a demo, is Responder. Anyone use Responder? OK, anyone have Responder used on them? Sorry, bud. It's like a cheat code, isn't it? it sucks. So I'm going to show you Responder real quick. I'm going to make sure my screen's. Can you guys see that OK? Yeah, good. So Responder is amazing. I'm actually going to shut down a service real quick. And I'm going to kill this just so you can see. So what this does is it literally opens up poisoners on LLMNR, NBNS, DNS, HTB server, it, you know, so forth and so on. And what this is going to do is, is, like Dave said, it's going to respond. So if I go to my Windows box and I say net use uh, besides CLE.local, oops, sorry, I have to do this, whack, whack. Besides CLE.local, right? Does, does besides CLE.local exist? I mean, here, I mean, I can, I can show you, like, NS lookup. Besides CLE.local. So it's pointing back to my local domain as, uh, so this is my IP. Oh, well, no, it pulled it up because it re responded, responded to it. <laughs> of course it is there. So it doesn't actually exist. But if I do net use, whack, whack, besides CLE.local slash this. Command completed successfully. And what's that? That's my hash. So the thing about this is, is now this isn't, this isn't like your SAM hash. So you can't use this and pass the hash. What this is, is this is all of the different parts of the handshake in the exchange. And what we're able to do is we're able to take that. I'm going to cancel this real quick. We're able to take that. and put it in our 8 GPU Titan X cracker. Now, the first one we set on fire, like literal flames fire. OK, so like the little, the first one burnt up. But we've got this one. Oh, yes, yeah, so is, is cracker on fire.com? We have that just in case. So like if something happens, uh, we all know to not run any of those things. Yeah, yeah, li li literal flames. So, uh, so this is ours over here, and then we've got Martin Boss on our team, who is, you know, one of the most advanced uh, password crackers that I know. And we've got a bunch of stuff in there, and we've got word lists from everyone. 
And so we're able to take that hash in there, and I guarantee you, like if it's if it's just a standard, you know, eight to fourteen characters, and it's just using upper lower numbers, we're probably going to crack it pretty quick. You know, even we just put it in there twenty four hours later, we can we'll get it. Now it's you know those aren't super fast hashes, on, you know, but they're still good enough. So then I, what I typically do is I'll get this, and I'm like, hey, I've in. Now I've got valid creds. Have I exploited anything at this point? Have I hit any of your vulnerabilities? No. No, I've taken just normal network traffic. And unless you have, and I'll show you how you can detect responder, but unless you've got something in between me, you're probably not going to see that I've even done anything. Now, the moment that I use those creds, you might be able to detect me. But chances are, I'm going to have someone's legit creds, and I'm just going to log into the box that they logged from. So that's the other thing with Responder, is that it'll actually tell you where they logged in from. And it keeps everything in these nice little log files. So if you come here, it'll actually tell you where you were able to get the hashes from. So I'm able to go back and uh, go after that box, because that's where that user's originating from. So I haven't exploited anything. I haven't tripped any of your vulnerabilities. Um, I'm using Windows exactly the way you Windows should be used. And this is on the wire. So, so far, you guys haven't, you know, so typically, most organizations, they don't even know that I'm there. So I crack it, move on, get into there. And once my screen comes back. So before we get there, you know, so oftentimes we'll get it to a client and they'll be like, hey, we know that you guys can do this right out the door, but what we want you to try and do is bypass our NAC. I'm like, sure, no problem, we can do that, right? So uh, Cisco ICE, right? A lot of Cisco ICE stuff. So I was on an engagement and, uh, you know, 802.1x popped up, plugged in, and there is a small period of time when the 802.1x window is up that if you Wireshark, you can actually get some traffic on there, even though you haven't authenticated. So I was going to leave the window up, was just going to you know, do some packet capture, just see what type of things were out there. And I'm like, oh, I forgot something. I hit cancel, and it gave me an IP. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. I'm like, well, maybe it was a misconfiguration. Maybe they just dumped me to some VLAN. And I start mapping, and I saw 6,000 hosts up. And I'm like, oh. So the, the, what the issue was is that all of we found out that all of their ICE configuration was designed for like a Cisco 400 switch, and when they switched over to the 300s, the commands were different. So all of their what they thought was working wasn't working, and it worked fine if you put your creds in, but if you hit cancel, those the things that were meant to like deny all the traffic, it wasn't being applied properly. So literally. Just hitting cancel, I was able to completely bypass their NAT controls. But there's other ways to do it too, right? So one of the best things that we do is when we get on site is we find an IP phone, right? And Cisco IP phones, most oftentimes their configurations are not protected. So we go to setup, we grab the MAC address, we change it to ours, and typically we're on. And we find that most people have their Cisco IP phones on the same segment as everything else. Um, so we're able to typically get past that. Now, I was on a client to where it did give me an IP and it did everything, but I could only hit the same thing in the, in the same broadcast domain. So that was good, right? But if I got any of their boxes in the same broadcast domain as me in layer two, I, I could still attack them, right? So it was still a misconfiguration, better than most, but most oftentimes we do this. So if you have any type of... Uh, uh, NAT controls or whatever the case may be, you want to make sure that it's configured properly so where if I don't authenticate, it does not give me access. Now, there are times when people are like, hey, we want to give internet access to our guests. Fine, totally legit, totally understand that. But you need to test that to make sure that it's actually working the way that you intend and that I can't pivot from that location to the next. This is literally one of the easier ways to do it. Anyone ever see one of these? I love these things. So I actually built my own. So uh, this is a great project if you uh, want to do soldering with your kids. Um, have them build them for you, and then you use them. Um, <laughs> and you, you just make it an educational thing. Um, but these are really easy to make. Um, throwing Star Land Tap, uh, literally you're, you plug in, so it's inline, and then you plug into the side, and it basically spans it. So you can actually read everything that's going on to there. So it's basically an easy way for us to identify, monitor traffic, look at, see what's going on. 
because um, a lot of printers, um, they have the 80, either 8021 is disabled because they can't handle it, or it's built in. So if we were to put this in between a printer, oftentimes we'll be able to get um, access and information to the internet. There's also other attacks too with like Odroids and other attacks like that. Um, but generally we find, at least I find, that a lot of the NAC configurations aren't, aren't set up the way that they're meant to be set up. So if you do have a NAC solution, you want to go back and you want to double check that. Cancel it. See if you get an IP. Like that's probably the simplest test that you can do is just validate to make sure that it dumps you to the place that you're meaning to be dumped. So uh, Dave kind of talked a little bit about this, but application whitelist. But so this is uh, Casey Smith who he's talking about. So sub T. So uh, as he recommended, um, do this. Uh, these are Buffalo overflows. <laughs> I've never had a Buffalo overflow before, but uh, I want to protect myself from them. Um, and then these are the other people that he was talking about: uh, Matt Graber, um, Harm Joy, Lee Holmes. If you do, are not following these people, you need to. If you're in defense and you're not following these people, you're doing yourself a disservice, 100%. I have gotten more things from these four people than I've done from anywhere else. I mean, Dave Kennedy is OK. Um, I just lost my bonus because of that, just trying to mention that. Um, you know, but these people are the people that you need to watch. They're doing a lot of the breakneck uh, research out there. So I want to show you something uh, that uh, uh, Casey specifically wrote. Um, he talked to you about, uh, Dave talked to you a little bit about WScript, but I want to talk to you about MS Build. Um, anyone have seen the MS Build attack yet? Mm, how this is going to be fun for me. So MS Build, it's in Windows, Microsoft.net, Framework, V4. So you guys can't see that. Oh yeah, you can. But it's it's really tiny, isn't it? Okay, msbuild.exe. Now the cool thing about msbuild.exe is that it will actually take an XML file and uh, compile it. So it's meant to be for like C sharp projects and stuff to that effect. Really cool utility. Built in and baked in on just about every Windows operating system up through 10. And um, you, you've sent it a C sharp project and it builds it just like a compiler would, which is great and fantastic. Uh, Sub T figured out that you can actually put other code in there um, and get it to execute. So this is his simple tasks uh, code. And if you look here, he's got this code here. Hello from a code fragment. And then he's got hello from a class down here. Now this is a standard C sharp code. You can put whatever you want in there, any type of C sharp code. Um, I'll let you guys uh, come up with your imaginations on what you might be able to put in there. So uh, if I call this, I say MS build exe, and I have it in here. As you can see, it said hello from a code fragment and hello from a class, right? So that's kind of cool. But what's even cooler is that you can actually do things like Mimi gets. Now, what process am I running? MS build. MS build. Am I running a rogue binary? No. Did I pull anything down from the internet? No. I'm just running a, it's, it's just a C-sharp project. And to make it even more fun, because I know you guys like this so much, um, it doesn't have to have the CS project extension. So if I come over here and I do uh, cats, if I rename this, because everyone's in, everyone is doing analytics and inspection on log files, right? You guys are inspecting all your log files? Yeah, I didn't think so. Call on the log file, which is just general text, right? So what about this? It's even more fun. Uh, let's go back over here. So we're 130. 
I don't even need it on disk. Ta-da! I don't even need it on disk. If you're not following Casey, you need to. How many is this? this raise your hand if this is a first for you. It's OK. You can be honest. It's all good. Yeah. This is the stuff that's winning. And I can't really say that it's bypassed everything, but so far it's bypassed everything. <laughs> um, it's it's really it, it's really fantastic, and because you can do the the SMB shares, like there's no issues there. Uh, so again, uh, you can do it as MS Build. So if I get a box on there and it's got SMB, I can just do it that way. So I'm not writing to the disk. AV is not going to trip it up. I'm calling a text file, so chances are it's probably not going to look at it as being malicious because it's not executable. And yet, so now I'm able to do a lot with MS Build. Um, so I did write not PowerShell. Uh, that was part of the reason. Uh, I was on an engagement. They started shutting things down. Did, uh, did you need me to go back to that? Oh, you're good. Uh, so, so I just, you know, they block PowerShell. And I'm like, that is PowerShell.exe, for those who don't know, it's, it literally does nothing. It's a host application. All of PowerShell magic is in a DLL. And it's in all of the other DLLs. PowerShell.exe is just a communication between you and what's going on in the run spaces. And I do a whole talk on PowerShell and stuff like that. But I'm like, I'm just going to rewrite it. And so I basically just said, fine. Uh, and so I rewrote it. I wrote not PowerShell just so I could get my PowerShell execution back. So, um, so NPS.exe, um, neat little utility. Um, I also built in some um, encode, decode uh, stuff in there so you can quickly do encoded or decoded command. Uh, but it works exactly just like PowerShell. Um, get date. Um, I can also do, so you can see what version it's running. Um, I specifically compiled it to this. I'll show you. So I specific, even if you have PowerShell 5, a lot of times you'll leave versions 4, 3, 2 still enabled. So there are ways to disable that. But I compiled NPS specifically to PowerShell 2. And there's a reason for that. Does anyone know why I specifically compiled NPS to 2, PowerShell 2? There it is. Because PowerShell logging starts at version 3. So, so the funny thing was, is one person was like, hey, why did you de compile this to 2? I can't do the detection on it. I'm like, that's, that's it. That's, that's why. So you can't detect it. But there are things that you can detect. And what Dave talked about was looking for any application loading that system.management.automation DLL. So I um, want to talk about a little bit more about a couple other PowerShell things. So one of the things that people think is that uh, execution policy um, is a is a control. So if I come over here and I say uh, import module uh, in Vay, right? Uh, uh, let's see. There we go. Uh, oh, I I think it needs to be. I think it's default. Oh, I think it's because it's already loaded. Hold on. There we go. So we get this net fancy little error message, right? Can't load it. It won't load. You know, you can't load your malicious script, whatever the case may be. OK. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you can see what I'm going to do. So I'm going to go up a tree. And here's my Mimi cats, right? So here's Mimi cats. So I'm going to say import module invoke Mimi cats. Not working. So then I do this. Now this is typically used for web requests, but you can do this.
And it's probably not going to run me because I'm. Oh, and now I am running an administrator. Ta da! Mimi cats. Execution policy explicitly was stated by Microsoft that it is not a security control. So if you feel like that that's your safeguard, uh, it's not good. The other thing about IEX um, is uh, if I do uh, invoke Mimi Cats, and I'm going to say test.txt. So if I do so there's my test.txt. It's not a PS1, right? So I'm uh, I'm actually going to choose a different file just to show you that it actually works. Uh, let's do PS1. Let's do uh, let's do the meme.ps1 because I didn't import that one. Uh, let's do move meme to meme.txt and then we'll go back up here and we'll say meme.txt so you can use actual text files with this as well so if you're looking specifically just for, this for PS1, PSM1, PS1 it, it's not enough right at this point, we're looking specifically for when you're actually calling these PowerShell commands. And that's where you really get into those 4104s. But there are ways around that. So one of the biggest uh, constraints is we've seen, uh, I've seen on a lot of sims, is that if you look at how much uh, space is available for the event log, it actually will truncate some of that. Some of these PowerShell commands are really, really, really long. So if you truncate that and your sim is not able to capture the entire event, you're going to be missing out on actually being able to capture what my attack is. So you want to evaluate your sim and make sure that you actually can pull that in. So the other thing that we, we uh, that I like to do um, is uh, the sticky keys attack. And Dave talked a little bit about this. Um, so everyone knows sticky keys, right? Hold on. Get my mouse. Right? Sticky keys, right? Nice little feature, um, able to help us out. But uh, this is actually how I get around smart cards. So uh, smart card readers, like if you do a remote desktop, like it won't let you log in unless you put a smart card in there. Really cool feature. Uh, but I'm able to just um, add this as a key. So basically, I'm using this image file execution options and setHC.exe, which is sticky keys. And I'm just pointing it to cmd.exe. So if I add this key, and I hit one, two, three, four, five. I get a new shell, but it, it says me. But if I lock my computer, and then I hit one, two, three, four, five, I'm now system. So just from that attack, right? And so this is how, so I was actually able to get past their smart card. Um, and once you get, obviously, once you get a command shell, uh, you know, obviously, I was able to do things like, um, uh, uh, you know, being able to browse. I was able to get open a, a, a window. Uh, let's see. Uh, so I'm actually respawning my instance as uh, NT Authority system. Um, you'll notice I've got my start menu down here. Okay, super simple to get around, right? I think I broke it. Oh, there we go. Oh, uh, don't worry, it's just password. It's what Dave told me to put. Okay. So sticky keys is a great one. Um, it's really nice to be able to, to spawn that, um, get past the smart card. It's really frustrating because I'd be like, yeah, I got past your smart card thing. They'd be like, how? I'm like, well, I found, you know, I used responder, found some creds, found out that he was local admin, uh, cracked his password, went to his box, replaced sticky keys, and got, you know, interactive login session. Um, there is something cool with this, this attack, and I'll show you from the defensive side. But I want to keep going and talk to a little bit else. So antivirus, uh, 
Antivirus is great. I, I, I'm not against antivirus. I know that there are a lot of people out there that run shops with zero antivirus. And they run the shops well. Um, Dave Kennedy's dad is actually one of them. Um, he's one of the key people is, uh, 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 that I it, you know, appreciate the fact that he's willing to you know, create a defensive structure in a school. So he works in a school nonetheless, and he runs it without AV. And he does it really well. He uses tools like Emmet and whatever. And I know that I know uh, like Emmet or some uh, Windows Defender stuff is going away, but he's able to do this. But oftentimes, and as Dave has pointed out, uh, a lot of the AVs is all signature based. So literally adding a bunch of comment lines or changing things around is all that's necessary to get over there. So, you know, I'm a big PowerShell guy. So I like having my PowerShell code obfuscated. Well. I don't want to have to do that manually. So a guy by the name of Daniel Bohannon, most amazing thing I see, saw, he presented this last year at, Power, at uh, DerbyCon. And he created this thing called Invoke Obfuscation, one of the coolest tools I've ever seen. So what we do is we take our code. So if I go over here, and I'm going to go to Unicorn, because Dave's awesome that way, right? And I say Windows, I'm interpreter, uh, reverse, HTTPS, and I put my IP 172.16.152, I think I was 140, right? 130. 130, 443, right? So Unicorn does all this, grabs, grabs my code, awesome, great. So then if I look at... So here's my PowerShell code. I can, you know, decode this, whatever. So let's say I take my, um, let's say I take my code, and let's say my code is, uh, I'll just do something simple like get date. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to uh, do string. Uh, I see options. I'm going to do uh, set script block to get date. Okay, so that's just that's just right now my script is just get date. Can you guys see that okay? No, you can't, can you? Let me see if I can move it over. That better? Make it a little bit bigger. Okay, can you guys see that now? Okay, so there's my code, get date. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come through and I'm going to say string. And I'm going to concatenate the entire command. So right now, if you look, this is now my command. So let's say I do it again, and again, and again, and again. Now if I take this and I say copy, it copied it to the clipboard. So if I come over here. Oh, because it's selected, it's going to do it. I'll just do copy again. If this works, I should show me the date. So this is going to mess around with your carbon black. This is going to mess around with your Splunk. This is going to mess around with a lot of the stuff that you've got going on. Right? So this is where it gets important to where you look at things uh, specific to that, like number of concatenations. Right? How many plus signs do you have in there? How long is the command? This is where really where it gets a lot more advanced on the detection side on what exactly is going on with this command. Now, there is a buffer limit to what you can do. However, there are ways around that. You can pull in those files, write them out to text files or whatever the case may be, and then add them in one by one in memory and then explode the command and then it'll run. So a lot of the code that I'll run, I'll just run through invoke obfuscation, and guess what? AV, no problem. None whatsoever. So love invoke obfuscation. If you haven't messed around with that, do that. So this is Daniel Bohannon. Sorry, I always take a second when I do full screen. So this is Daniel Bohannon. So he wrote that. He actually wrote a, something else new. Uh, invoke Cradle Crafter. So that's something else that you want to take a look at. Um, got some really cool stuff out there. So you want to make sure you're following him as well. All right. Uh, advanced Threat Detection. 
Now, in the interest of protecting other companies, just because you know I don't like to slam other people, I have obfuscated this, but I got a interpreter shell, um, and I was able to identify that there was this service running. So I, I obfuscated it, so you don't know which one it was. I'll let you guys guess. Um, but it's always nice to get a interpreter shell and to see that on there. And as Dave you know, mentioned earlier, it doesn't take much to actually turn some of those things off. But it's not just this product. Um, Bit9 I found on there, you know, it, it, it's all dependent on configuration. Um, we Obviously, you see Semantic, you'll see McAfee, you'll see all sorts of things. And I love getting those interpreter shells and doing a process list and seeing those things running. It, and this is, this is a shell from using MS Build, right? No, this isn't some fancy exploit. This is just MS Build with a text file. That's it. And no problems whatsoever. Um, uh, John, you know, mentioned this a little bit earlier, but, you know, this is one of those big things where he was talking about, you know, specifically bypassing uh, salience. Um, there's a lot of advanced threat detection out there, and it works really well. However, what's, what, we're, what I'm seeing from a purple team standpoint, when I sit down and I talk with the defense, defense teams, they put all of their eggs in one basket. They're like, man, we've got silence, we've got this, and it stopped this last pen tester. I'm like, that's awesome, but not every pen tester is the same, right? Everyone has different skills, everyone has different backgrounds, everyone has different exploits, different techniques. You can't just assume that this is going to be there. It's, it's not to say that it's bad. It's not to say that you shouldn't use it. But what you should do is just automatically assume that you're already owned. Just That's why like, you walk in, you're like, another day and I'm owned. Yay, let's go to work. Just assume. Uh, one of the other things I like doing is uh, your federated services. Uh, this is typically an external. So this is old. Right, 117 million LinkedIn passwords from 2012, old. Okay, so we've cracked a ton of them, right? So I found a federated server. I found some user IDs. They had some really old passwords in there, even with like the years of like 2012, 2013. And so originally I was like, well, let me see if I can construct. Maybe they've changed over the years. And then I was like, fuck it, I'm just gonna run these. And I got a shell. The same password that they were using on LinkedIn in 2012, they were using on this organization today. Needless to say, that was an awkward conversation for the defense team. I'm like, yeah, they're like, so did you change the password? I'm like, no. They're like, the same exact one. I'm, yep. They're like, you got you in? Yep. No problems. Fuck. Nope. No, it was 2012. Yep. Now, they were, they, they were like, well, maybe she rolled. And I'm like, no. <laughs> we're talking like 2012. You shouldn't be rolling that far, that, that far back. No, 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 no. It's not the way that this works. Besides, why was she using like that password from LinkedIn on the corporate network? That's a big no-no. But here's the thing. Do you guys know that you're not, that your users aren't? Your users are a creature of habit. You set like a window of like five most used passwords. When they reset their passwords, they're going to be like, one, two, three, four, five, and boom, they're right back to where they were. It happens, right? Users are creatures of habit. You know, and uh, you guys read the new NIST standards where they're actually saying, like, get rid of the 90 day, 180 day password reset? They're actually saying, get rid of it because it creates too much problem. Yeah, absolutely. Get rid of it. I'm all for it. It's all about entropy, it's all about complexity. Make it pass phrases, make it something unique. You know, I, 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 uh, when I was doing infrastructure, you know, we were big on getting rid of all the sticky notes on the monitors because a lot of people were putting their passwords on there. So I go to someone, I'm doing an audit, and it says, it literally says, Dr. DR period space APPT at sign 230. And she came back, and I'm like, I know, I know, I know. I'm like, I'm really sorry. I should have removed my password. I'm like, that's your password? I'm not even mad. That's awesome. <laughs> like, keep it up there. I don't care. Like, literally, like, getting people to understand that the password is not so much about, you know, this, the constant change. It's literally is just working on how secure it is. Now, if you have any indicator of compromise, that's when you change it. That's what NIST is saying. You know, if there's any indication that they might be compromised, whatever, the case, that's when you change. 
but it's all about keeping that entropy, getting people used to that, um, and, and getting it to, the where, to where the password is a security feature without it necessarily becoming a, an issue, right? So like if you're cooking dinner, and you're in the middle of cooking, and every 30 seconds your oven turns off, how pissed off are you going to be on Thanksgiving? Oh, you got to go reset the pet. You got to go turn the oven back on. Hold on. Okay, oven's back on. We're good. Next 45 seconds. Turns off again. Dude, you'd be, like, you're going to be pissed, right? You're going to come up with some way to keep that oven on so you can get your job done, right? That's what the users are doing. And we get pissed off at them. We're like, why would you do that? Bullshit. We would do that. Like, we're all trying to get our job done. That's like people getting upset for users opening up uh, emails and uh, links and attachments. You guys do understand that email was designed for sending links and attachments, right? Like that's the sole purpose of the application. That's like having a visitor come over and they come through the front, like, come through the front front door, and you're like, "What the fuck are you doing? You use the front door. That's what it's there for. You can't get pissed off at users for opening up links." And there's more and more advanced stuff, even the hovering. Did you guys see the attack where just hovering the link caused the attack to, to fire? The basic thing we told the users to do to keep them safe caused the issue. And they're like, fuck it, man. I'm just going to click everything from now on, man. AV will catch it. <laughs> it's like, fuck this, right? And we can't get pissed at the users. We can't. And if you are, you need to stop. They are using the application the way it was designed. You guys know the internet, email, that all came from CERN and scientists, right? Their sole purpose was to share information. That's what it was designed for. Now, it's bad on us that we're still using something that's like really, really old, and we haven't changed the protocol at all. But that's what it's designed for. So you can't get mad if they open an attachment. You can't get mad if they click a link. That's, that's what it's there for. So we need to come up with ways to figure out how we handle that. And you know what? Users are going to click links, bottom line. That's it. Resign yourself. That's like, people, that's like people trying to fight the word cyber. It's here. It's going to stay. Guess what? People are going to click links. They're going to open attachments. Get over it. Okay. Now that we're over it, we can actually work towards making things better. My favorite attack. Tomcat. Anyone know this one? <laughs> I love Tomcat. So Apache Tomcat is probably one of the most giddy things that I see uh, on, a, uh, on a, a system. And this is one where it's super duper simple. Uh, Tomcat by default has a lot of uh, default creds. So admin, admin, manager, manager, rule one, rule one, root, Tomcat. Uh, these are all in Metasploit, by the way. So if you look at the auxiliary module for Apache manager login, it points to this. And so we'll, typically what we'll do is we'll look for port 8080. One port at a time, remember what I told you? We'll look for port 8080, and then we'll run this. Now, most people, if they are ingesting any logs, even if it is from servers, they're not ingesting web logs. They're not ingesting all of those get requests. So me logging into their Tomcat, no insight whatsoever. I find Tomcat Tomcat, and oftentimes, it's running as a local administrator account, which allows me to upload a war file using the manager application, and I'm now MT system authority. Tomcat is probably, by far, like, if I get Tomcat, I'm like, it's over. I'm like, it's done. Look for, look for default creds. So um, how many of you guys uh, consider MFP as a potential security risk to your organization? Uh, MFP is multifunction printer. Good. Because we've gotten DA from MFPs several times. In fact, Adrian, who does all our recording, that was one of his big things. Um, so one of the cool things about uh, MFPs is that they have LDAP integration, which is awesome. Makes it easier. You can lock things down, like you know, especially for legal, financial, uh, or even healthcare, where you don't want like confidential information spitting out. In fact, there's even regulatory things that says you can't do that. Like you have to go release it at the copier to make sure someone else can't pick it up. So you integrate with ADFS to make it easier. The problem is, is that if you leave default creds on a lot of your systems to where I can log into it, what I do is I spawn up Responder, and then what I do is I change the server IP to my attacking IP, and then I hit test. And you know what it sends me? It sends me your credentials in clear text. 
In fact, it works so well that I get a guy by the name of Daryl Highland created an entire infrastructure around it. Um, he's actually known uh, around the Dayton uh, OISF, uh, Ohio InfoSec Security Forum. Um, so he wrote an entire thing, uh, uh, of, it's called Pareta, and literally it's just a printer, a, a MFP attacker's dream. And you go after all of these systems and boom, you can get credentials and everything else to that effect. This is by far my favorite. If I'm able to dump all of your users from your domain controller, um, it literally is season year. Summer 2017, spring 2017. I was on an engagement, and uh, it was uh, it was it was a long engagement, and I had one set of creds, and it was like uh, I think it was winter 2017. And he reset his password, and I'm like, oh, I lost it. And I'm like, wait, let me try this. Summer 2017. I'm in. I'm good. No problem. I got three more months. <laughs> so you need to audit your systems. You need to know if anyone's using uh, season year. Uh, you, I'll tell you, even, even if it's just like uh, you know, your organization year. So that's a big one, too. Uh, we find that a lot. Uh, some of the other ones we find are um, IT support. So I was actually working on a gig. I call IT support. I'm like, hey, I'm having a real hard time with my password because I had a legit login, right? And so I'm like, hey, I'm having a hard time, whatever. He's like, don't worry, uh, just do it. You know, uh, he reset it to like, uh, you know, new user one. I'm like, cool, thanks, man. So I log in, but it didn't force me to reset it. I'm like, hmm. 243 accounts later, <laughs> right? And then I was like, well, let me try this. New user two, another 72 counts. New user three, another 50, right? Users are creatures of habit. And if your IT support desk is doing that type of stuff, your users are just going to keep going. Again, I'm not ex I, I haven't exploited anything. I've used default creds. I've used, you know, basically cracking your weak password policies. I haven't exploited anything. I haven't had to download any random tool. I'm not tripping anything up. I'm using things exactly the way they're meant to be used. And yet I'm still able to get domain admin because of the way that the, the de defense is, met, is, done, is, is taken care of. So I've talked a lot about um, what I do. But I'm not the type of person that just says, I broke your shit, you're welcome, and walk away. It's not the way I roll. Okay. Defense, 13 years, defense at heart, that's where, I, that's where I'm at. So, I don't want you guys to rage quit, okay? And, and this is probably my favorite thing from uh, Rogue One. Is this mic on? Is there? Hold on. Hold on, let me go back. Is it? It's up. It says on. OK, we good now? So I'm here to help you. Congratulations. You are being rescued. That's OK. He says, congratulations, you're being rescued. Please do not resist. <laughs> so detection is going to be your primary defense. It really is. Um, was anyone prepared uh, for uh, all of the NSA dumps before they happened? Anyone? Anyone have signatures ready to go for that? OK, good. What about MS-17010, which is the new MS-08068, uh, uh, by the way? Anyone prepared for that before Patch Tuesday? Anyone ready for the Patch Tuesday that's coming up? You guys are good? You're already set? You're not. Understand that you're not able to detect that. Until they tell you, you're not able to defend against it. So if your defense focuses only on initial vector, you're always going to be playing catch up. You'll never be ahead of the game because you're solely focusing your defense on those initial vectors. Just assume you're owned. Done. We hired the new kid, Ben 10. 
He looks like he's 12. I'm not sure if he knows about computers, but man, he sure is eating up a lot of CPU cycles. What's going on? One of the biggest things I can tell you is if you have no detection whatsoever, you need it. And it's, you can get free stuff. Go get an Elk Stack. Elasticsearch, Logstash, Log and Kibana. You need at least something. Because you can identify a lot of the stuff that I just did with an Elk Stack. And it's free. Done. You need to be able to identify that. Windows Logging Cheat Sheet. One of the coolest things I've seen. Uh, anyone know what uh, event ID uh, 4624 is? Anyone? Yeah, that's new user login created. Uh, what about 70, uh, 7042? Anyone? Yeah, that's new process. Uh, that's a, a user account added. 4688. Anyone know what that is? Process creation. Correct. Now, is tracking 4688 enabled by default in Windows? Yes or no? No. But even if you did enable it without a specific KB patch, you will only get the primary process. You won't get the parameters. So if you want to see, I'll show you. So if you want to see what's going on in your event logs, so here's my 4688. And I'm sorry, I can't really, uh, I can't really make this bigger. But if you want to see what happens after the command, you need a specific KB. 4688, that's how you're going to detect PowerShell. That's how you're going to detect other rogue binaries. That's how you're going to see what's going on in your network. 4688, you need to know what that event ID is. Some other commands. Um, anyone know what system info does on Windows? Anyone? Thanks for spoiling it, Jason. What are those? Hot fixes. Guess what I can do with that? I can download this entire thing output as a low-level user, by the way. I don't even need to be, um, I don't need to be an administrator. Nah. Ain't nobody got time for that. And I can load this into a tool called Windows Exploit Suggester. <laughs> and what it'll do is it'll tell me whether or not there's an exploit available in exploit DB or if there's already a Metasploit module there. And it'll tell me it's a severity rating. So the only thing, so if I need privilege escalation, I would run system info, run it through Windows Exploit Suggester, and typically I have a way of identifying if you don't have a patch installed. Super simple. But if you're not looking for those 4688s, how do you know that I'm running the command? You gotta remember, what happens if I'm a user in your network and I'm gonna, ra I'm gonna, I'm gonna rage quit? I'm not an attacker from the outside, I'm an attacker from the inside. So where's your insight if you're not doing detection? So some other ones, who am I? Net user, right? Anything with slash domain on it. Net user domain. Does anyone know what net space user space forward slash domain does? It dumps your domain controller. Every user. So if I have a shell, I run net user forward slash domain from any box as a low level user, I get all of your users, which allows me to try summer 2017 against all of them. So, super simple. WMIC commands, PowerShell commands. Um, so I will tell you that somebody did block my net user. I'm like, oh, you're sneaky. So of course, when you block something for me, I write something new. So I wrote this thing called get ad user. And the cool thing about this is that it uses specifically to PowerShell 2. And I'm able to actually dump your entire domain controller without actually calling net user. And the cool thing is, is I can actually call like individual fields and make it common delineated. And one of the best fields I can pull from your domain controller is your description field. Because oftentimes for service level accounts, it, the description will be the password is something. And I get giddy. So sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't, but most of the time it actually works. And they're like, ah. So, um, so there's that. Some other uh, strategies is uh, image file execution. So I showed you guys how we can do sticky keys, right? Right, with this command? Here's something cool that you can do. 
So you can actually use this to your advantage. Uh, so I'm going to go into my registry. Because uh, I had my sticky keys in there, so I'm, gonna re I'm just going to remove it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that same command. Um, and instead of me doing uh, setHC, I'm going to do PowerShell. And if you point it to a binary that doesn't exist, like, right? So now if I type PowerShell, PowerShell.exe no longer exists. So if you need PowerShell on a system, you can just remove that key, do your PowerShell stuff, and add it back. You can even have that as a startup script. So you can use this exploit that we use to your advantage on the defensive side. And you can do this for multiple different things. So the, the cool thing about this is that this will actually cover it for multiple things. So if I have a shell on the system and I try and run PowerShell, I'm going to get PowerShell, it can't find it. And then I'm going to be all salty and upset. I'll probably write something new at that point. But, you know, this is the way you can kind of do that. Um, if you do a purple team, if you do a pen test, you need to make sure that you're getting the value out of it. If it's just a pen test of a VA scan and just validation, I question the value. If your red team comes in and the only thing they tell you is that I broke your shit, congratulations, I, I question the value in that. You need, as defenders, those pen tests need to give you ideas and guidance on how you can strengthen your, your team. Our purple, that's exactly what we do in our purple team. I don't do anything red when I'm on purple team. I do all the blue. I sit alongside you and I use your resources and I'm like, this is how we detect this attack. One of the other things is creating a path of least resistance. So I wanted to show you this really quick. I know I'm running out of time, but we were a little late. Um, so there is a way to detect and uh, deal with responder. So if I go back to responder, um, actually, I'm going to hold off for just a second. I'm going to come right here. So I wrote this thing called Invoke Honeycreds. And what this does is this allows you to create a user that doesn't exist. But when you create the user, you want to make it look legit. You don't want to name it like, ha ha, got you, pen tester, because I'm know i going to know that that's not legit. But you, and you don't have to make it on a legit domain. So you could do it like, you know, like tsdev, right? And you could do it as sccm updater, svc. Looks like a service account, right? You want it to make it look like it's a service account. You don't want to use a user account because it's going to be very chatty. Are users super duper chatty with all of their stuff? No. Are service accounts? Yes. Then what you can do is do a complicated password like Okay, so you hit OK, and what this is doing is only putting it on the wire in the same broadcast domain, right? The only way someone's going to see this if they're running a tool like Responder. So if I come in here, not only will it give me the hash, but I also send clear text creds. It's, as an attacker, if I have a hash or clear text creds, which one am I going to use first? Absolutely. I'm baiting the attacker. Because the moment that they use that, I get a 4648 event ID, and I know for immediately that I have an indicator of compromise, which is 100%, because no one should ever even know that this credential exists. They can't see it in AD. They can't see it in the local SAM. It's only on the wire. And that is how you can catch people, and typically using Responder. Um, so far, I haven't been on an engagement where they've done this. But this is a great way to have that indicator of compromise that someone's messing around on your network. Um, I already talked about assume that you've already been pwned. Um, you do want uh, you know, to have the ADT, but just expect them that they're going to bypass it. And this is important. Users will click on things, but that doesn't mean you stop educating. You do know that training is different than educating, right? In training, you don't care whether they get your stuff or not. In education, you do. I educate my kids not to touch the stove. I don't just put it. I don't just have them watch a little, you know, thirty-second blip saying "stove is hot, don't touch." Right? It's a different thing. You want to educate them. 
Make sure your defense team understands the offense. If, how in the world can you defend against something that you know nothing about? If you're not seeing what the attacks look like, if you're not understanding what's going on. Anyone know what the SPN service account attack is? So the SPN attack is uh, built into Impacket. Um, and I don't have a domain controller, I can do this. But you point at a domain controller, and it dumps all of your service level accounts, and it gives you a hash. And you can crack that hash. All I need is a low-level user, and I can, I can get your service level accounts. So if you're using a service account with a weak credential, I'm going to crack it. And it's super simple. And right now, there is zero detection. I have spent hours and hours and hours trying to detect this attack. It's impossible because there's so much Kerberos noise that it's impossible to identify the attack from normal Kerberos traffic. Right now, your only control is to make sure that all your service level accounts have a minimum character length of 25 characters, at the minimum. Because you can't load it in past 15 into the, into the current hashcat, but that's not to say they're not going to expand it. You need at least 25 characters for your service level accounts. So in conclusion, it seems like we're always trying to play catch up, that no matter what we do, we're failing. But my kids love these Kaizo levels um, in Mario Maker. I absolutely hate them. I'm horrible at them. There is no possible way I will ever complete one of these levels, and I've given up. I don't want you guys to give up. It's possible. It takes a lot of extra work. It takes work uh, to, to do defense well, and part of it is just making sure that you guys continue. As you continue, eventually, you'll get to the point where you're doing defense much better than once you once were. You will fail along the way. That's OK. You will have developers who spin up boxes that they shouldn't. You will have default creds. But eventually, you'll get to the point where you actually have a defense that's going to work out really well. Now, I, I wanna sh this is not a long video, so I just want to show it to you real quick. Um, this, this, does, um, this guy does complete it. And I want to show you that I, sh I started out the, uh, the talk with sounding very like game over. It's done. I hacked all your stuff. But it, you will have game overs. But that's not to say that you can't start again. You will have failures. You will have weak credentials. You will have Tomcats that weren't supposed to be there. But the whole idea is to keep it up, keep persisting, and eventually we're going to get defense where it needs to be. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Check, check. Okay. Um, so before we uh, uh, before we close out, um, once again, thank you, Ben Ten. We have a.